About 300,000 Canadians die every year in Canada. That's a lot. Approximately the same population that exists in the entire Essex County dies every year in our country. And some of them go home to be with the Lord and some of them enter into a Christless eternity, unfortunately. But because so many people die, I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives have had the opportunity to attend funerals where we reflect upon the lives of those that have been lost to cancer, to disease, to old age, whatever it might be. But how many of you have had the opportunity to subsequently visit a graveside and to perhaps tend to the site, to, to lay down some flowers or to pray or to just sit and reflect upon the life of someone that you have lost? It's not uncommon for human beings to do that. It's very common for human beings to want to visit a graveside to pay honor and homage to someone that they have loved and who has affected their lives. And we see that same thing taking place on the first Resurrection Sunday when a group of women got up early and they made their way to Jesus' tomb. At least five of them, the scriptures tell us, at least five of them went to Jesus' tomb to tend to his gravesite. This in and of itself was not an unusual thing. But what was unusual, what made this the most unusual graveside visitation ever was that they came expecting to find a corpse but found something of infinite value presented to them. Study with me, if you will, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. In this text, we have a record of that first Resurrection Sunday and this graveside visitation from these early followers of Jesus Christ. I mentioned to you on Friday, and I, I'm thinking about this in my mind, trying to understand it further. I don't have a great answer for you, but you can maybe meditate upon it and help me with this. It's, I just find it fascinating and interesting that on Good Friday, it was all men who were professing faith, who were declaring the lordship of Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross. But on Easter Sunday, it's all women that are the first to go, that are the first to acknowledge, that are the first to herald the gospel message. And so the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 3, that on the first day of the week, that would be the Sunday at early dawn. They didn't want to sleep in. They didn't go out for brunch. They didn't wait around. They didn't drink a second cup of coffee. They wanted to get there quick, which shows their pain and their adoration for Jesus and their sense of loss. They went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. So they intended to find a couple soldiers there that would help them to roll aside the tomb stone and they would go in and they would add more spices to Jesus' corpse. But instead, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This tips us off to something that is fundamental and fascinating about the Christian faith, the gospel message. And that is that you won't find what you might be expecting in Jesus, but you'll find infinitely more. Many people come to Christ looking for a friend or looking for some good moral teaching. You know, he's a great moral teacher, so let's go go to church and maybe we can pick up on some tips for how to, I don't know, have a better marriage or take care of our children or be at peace with our own flaws. People are often interested in Jesus, but what they discover when they find the full message of the gospel is much, much more, something of infinite value. Keep in mind that these women up till now had already received much from Jesus. They had received things like acceptance and love. Some of Jesus' early followers were like prostitutes. Not a great occupation. They had found acceptance and love. They had found forgiveness in Christ. They had found a sense of belonging. And they had discovered truth. And their lives had been transformed and they were on a mission now to live for something beyond themselves, beyond their sensual appetites, their hopeless circumstances. So they'd been blessed by Jesus up till now with 
with very much. But today, on this first Resurrection Sunday, they found something greater than they could have possibly imagined, and it needed to be interpreted for them. It was an empty tomb. We often refer to Jesus' tomb as borrowed. Normally when someone borrows something, they borrow it for a little too long, don't they? It's like, um, you have to make the phone call. Can I, can I get that tool back? I kind of need it. Well, when Jesus borrowed this tomb, I mean, he didn't borrow it for very long at all. He just borrowed it for a few days. Jesus was out of the tomb, and he was not to be found in the state that they expected him to be found in. Now, while they did not know it yet, this would ultimately become the greatest find in all of human history. The greatest find in all of human history. It's interesting to find precious things, things that are of interest to you. A couple of my nephews came over yesterday with their metal detectors, and they asked me, can we walk around the property to see if we could find you know, buried treasure? And they found some old wrenches and some pieces of wire and some nails, and I was delighted because now I don't have to run over them with my lawnmower. But it's interesting to search for things and to find things that you consider valuable, but this would become the greatest find in human history. They would find someone who had conquered, of all things, our greatest foe. Our greatest foe is not a virus. Our greatest foe, foe is not social injustice. Our greatest foe is not a questionable government. Our greatest foe is death. Everybody ultimately dies. We know this. Look at the world around us. Death dominates the news cycles of our newspapers and media outlets. People are always talking about the disasters. You want to be depressed? Go read the news. You want to find joy? Turn the news off. Death and disease and despair dominate the news cycles. It sells papers. People listen to that stuff. Death strikes fear into people. And unfortunately for the past year, we've seen that in bold font. The number of people that are absolutely terrified of death to the point that they're not even logical anymore. While there is much debate about the efficacy of masks, let's suppose for a moment that they are absolutely helpful in protecting us from viral transmission. Can we assume that just for a moment? But t tell me this, why is it that when I drive out in the countryside, this happened to me recently, driving out in the countryside in the middle of Nowheresville, Ontario, I see a van pulled over and an older lady is down in the ditch picking something by herself with nobody within, I don't know, a mile and a half with a mask on. Protecting herself from what? She's by herself. But when people are overcome with fear, they lose rational thinking. This is the world that we live in. We know there's a lot of money in cosmetic surgery as well. A lot of people spend their treasures trying to mask the inevitability of death. We're all getting older. You look in the mirror. I told you this a few weeks ago when I was preaching. I'll tell you again. I came in from outside maybe about a month back and I was washing my face in the mirror and I looked up and the sun was kind of coming through. And for a moment I thought to myself, who is this guy I'm looking at? This looks like my dad. I didn't know I had that many lines on my face. We're all in the process of getting older. But think about this. Why is it that so many people are afraid of dying? You might think, well, I'm afraid of dying. Why wouldn't you be afraid of dying? But think about it from why are you afraid of dying? You ever actually consider that question? Why are you afraid of dying? It's inevitable. Does it, does it really matter in the bigger picture of things, whether you live for 35 years or 85 years? No, it doesn't matter. Is the world not going to go on without you? There was an eternity that existed before you ever showed up, before I ever showed up. Why is it that we're so afraid of dying? 
When if you look at it logically, sort of objectively, and especially from the perspective of people who have received resurrection life and hope in eternal life, we shouldn't be afraid of death at all. Why does death rattle our cages so much? Why do we allow it to distract us so much? Folks, when I die, don't mourn for too long. Please don't mourn for too long. Because I know that when I die, I will be with Christ. And yeah, I get it. We all want to live a little longer to see our children marry. Maybe to meet our first, second, or third grandchild. To experience retirement. But really, at the end of the day, does, does that really matter that much? No. It doesn't matter at all, really, in the eternal scheme of things. But for the unbeliever, the person that does not have resurrection life, that is not celebrating what we're celebrating today, they have much to fear. Much to fear. Because the only thing that awaits them is eternal death. I wish that the only thing that awaited them was annihilation. That'd be the easy way out. But the Bible teaches eternal conscious torment. That you were either resurrected to eternal living or you're resurrected to eternal dying. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, he has conquered death. And if we respond to him in faith and believe in him and accept him as our savior, his life becomes our life. And the victory that he experienced in the grave becomes our experience as well. His story becomes our story. His win becomes our win. His life becomes our life. This is why what these women experienced at that empty tomb 2,000 years ago was the most marvelous find in human history. And it puts perspective on everything for us. It gives us hope. It gives us great joy. Have you found new life in Jesus Christ? Follow-up question, are you living as if you have new life in Jesus Christ? Or are you still living in fear of death and fear of dying, worried because you saw a few wrinkles in your face this week? This is not the Christian way. The Christian way is hope that nobody can take, that nobody can steal because Jesus Christ has secured it for us. Now, when we experience life in Christ and fellowship with Christ, we also encounter truth that transforms us. In Christ, we are enlightened to the truth the truth of many things, the truth of our identity, the truth of our existence, the truth of who God is. And there's some truth that is immediately presented to these women as they seek to interpret what they had just encountered. Because they're at the the empty tomb. We know the rest of the story, but they're still processing it. And so God delivers a message to them through two angelic visitors. In verse 4 it says, while they were perplexed about this, trying to figure it out, trying to interpret it, wondering what in the world was going on, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? What an incredible question. I mean, this, this is a question, this is like one of the Greatest questions ever asked in all of human history. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered these words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11, that is the 11 that was left, the 12 minus Judas, and to all the rest. What's going on here? These women receive some revelation from God that interprets what they were experiencing, that is grounded in prophecy past, and that gives them hope, and by extension, the world hope forever and ever and ever. Let's talk about epistemology for a moment. Do you even know what that word means? (laughs) It's not a common word. But epistemology and philosophy is the study of knowledge. How do we know things to be true? Now, apart from God, the standard answer to that 
by the average Westerner is, oh, human reason. That's how we know things to be true. So we see things, we perform experiments, we read written documents, we try to connect the dots, we ask questions, and we arrive at truth. Now this is the dominant worldview in the West to the point that when you even take something that's kind of slippery and ever-changing and often makes mistakes like science, science, the word science, which we're not opposed to, we're not opposed to good science, but the word science in most people's ears means absolute fact, absolute truth. We observe, we test, we hypothesize, we retest, we conclude science. And then the next generation comes along and they turn our scientific hypotheses on their head more often than not. We don't talk about that too much. But we have this notion that if you really want to know that which is true, talk to smart people. That human ingenuity, human intellect, human capacity to know and to figure things out is literally unlimited. And this is why we live in an age of the experts. Mostly godless people that are but they're experts in science. They're experts in biology. They're experts in the, the economy. They're experts in social structures. They're experts in governance. They've never consulted the scripture. Most of their theories are in contravention of scripture. But they're the experts. Why? Because we believe that the ultimate epistemological system is human reason. Now, this is relatively new. In fact, it just resulted from the enlightenment just a few hundred years ago, really. This notion that humanity has truth by the tail. The word of God does not dismiss human reasoning. For example, in 1 John chapter 4, we're called to test the spirits. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we're told to give a reason, an apologetic, for the hope that we have in Christ. The word of God is not opposed to human reason, but the word of God adds something superior to human reason. It's called revelation. Human reason and revelation provides us with the full picture. And revelation, by the way, always trumps human reason. It informs it. It affects it. It shapes it. You see, the thoughts of God are higher than ours. The thoughts of God are superior to ours. God's knowledge is superior to ours. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God's thinking on things is always superior to ours. So if you really want to live your life successfully, be reasonable. But you also need to expose yourself to revelation. Because until you understand the thoughts of God, you will always be deficient in how you interpret life. Without revelation, these women would have been left hypothesizing. Did someone steal the body? This was a theory that the authorities started to spread. Did we go to the wrong tomb? Did someone mix magic mushrooms in with our porridge this morning? Are we seeing things? Human reason in and of itself leaves us confused, questioning, unsure. But when you add divine revelation to the mix, suddenly the light goes on. You're like, okay, I understand now. I get it. And through the word of God, announcements and pronouncements are made as we see here. Through the word of God, through the revelation of, of scripture, we're reminded of how prophecies have been fulfilled through different events in human history. The word of God gives us direction. The word of God gives us purpose in life. The word of God allows us to see above the current circumstances of life, to see the big picture. You see, one of the problems going on in society today is tunnel vision. Myopic vision. We just focus on one thing. We become fixated on stopping a virus. We have to stop a virus. Stay home. We got to stop the virus. That's all it's about. Forget the economy. Forget people's spiritual lives, mental health, emotional health. We can deal with that later. Virus, virus, virus. It's just fixated on this issue because people don't see the big picture. They think we're nuts for being here today. Why is this necessary? 
Why is it necessary? Salvations can wait. Conversions can wait. Your sentimental religious drivel can wait. Put that on hold. And then they start to reinterpret our ethical standards. They now have a handle on what it means to love your neighbor and we're the haters. So this is where human reason by itself leaves us. We don't see the big picture. We can't see the broad, broader story. We just try to figure things out by ourselves and manage it as best as we can. And we always fail. Look at the world around us. The smarter we get, the stupider we get. The more degrees we issue in our universities, the more the social IQ drops because people are being told lies. And even when they're told truth, they're told the lie that you can rely upon the truth that you know by itself to figure your way through life. So now truth becomes misapplied and misused in life. This is the world that we live in. But fortunately, in the word of God, we have revelation. So we're smarter. We know more. Not because we were born smarter. Not because we're prideful. But we have the wisdom of God on our side. To guide us and to direct us. Without revelation, all you do is see the world through dirty glasses. I don't wear glasses, but I know some of you do. My wife does. It's irritating when your glasses get kind of dirty, right? But I know what it's like to drive with a dirty windshield with bugs all over it. Without revelation, you see, but you see as if through a glass darkly. It's like looking at life through dirty glasses. This is why we need God to make sense of life. And God makes sense of this situation here. The angel reveals the truth later affirmed by human experience as they actually see the risen Christ and are able to recall, oh, that's what he meant back in Galilee when he said such and such. Perhaps you've come to church today and you would be willing to admit to yourself that your life's a little confusing at times, that you struggle with anxiety, that you can't make sense out of it. May I kindly suggest to you that you need to spend more time in the word of God, listening, believing, receiving what God has. When God speaks truth, when you actually take time to digest scripture, life becomes far less confusing. It becomes much more simple. You have clarity on things. You know who you are. You're not afraid of death. You know what God's purposes and promises are. You know how your marriage is supposed to function. You know the kind of person you should be pursuing to be married. You know how to raise your kids. You know how to handle your money. You know how to respond to the government. You know how to deal with the issues of life. You know how to process lies. You know how to separate truth from error. <laughs> it's great. Great clarity comes as we study the word of God. Without revelation, we're left confused, fearful, unsure, but God's word clarifies our thinking, settles our hearts, and heals our anxiety like nothing else. It doesn't happen overnight, of course, because we're always progressively studying and refining and then seeking to put it into practice. But as you can commit yourself to the long haul, there's only blessing when you have truth revealed to you by God. By the way, when you have truth, it's not just for you. It's also supposed to be dispersed to others. So in Christ, we become witnesses to the revelation of God's resurrection. When we receive, we offer. When we, what we hear, we tell. Verse 10 says, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women, so at least two more, so there must have been at least five there, with them who told these things to the apostles. So they go and tell the apostles, Hey, guess what? We went to the tomb. It was empty. And a couple of angels told us Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Oh, yeah, right. Come on. What's wrong with you? These are men of God, and they still didn't get it. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. So I like his enthusiasm there. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling 
at what had happened. What was revealed to these women, they revealed to others. This would ultimately spill in, spill over into the great commissioning that God gives his people, that we are now his ambassadors. This is Christ's embassy. This is Christ's embassy. We are his ambassadors. Put here in this world, in this generation, in this country, in this city at this time, to represent the purposes of God and to herald his message out into a confused world. It's common, as we see here, to initially be met with disbelief. I'm sure many of you who have shared your faith robustly have had those times when you're talking to a non-Christian, maybe even someone who declares himself to be an atheist, and they say, I don't, that, that, that sounds far-fetched. I don't believe that. And so you begin to process and you begin to help them to reason through things and you take them to the word of God. And as they process things and as you expose them to God's word, you're also praying that God would stir their hearts and he would awaken them to truth. And they either come to faith in Jesus Christ or they continue on in disbelief and their life doesn't get better. Maybe at times you've been told a tale as well and you're like, I don't know if I believe that. I mean... I love you, but I remember when I was very young and I was really convicted of my sin and I'd been exposed to the gospel many times before, so I knew the content of it, but it had never arrested me yet. But when I was arrested by the gospel and I was convicted of my sin and I knew I was lost, as I processed that in hindsight, the biggest hang up for me is I thought it was too simple. There's gotta be a trick to this because even as a youngster, I knew that in life, when you receive a reward, it's generally because you've earned it. You have to do something to get a paycheck, right? You have to perform. You have to have a good resume in order to get a job. You have to do in order to receive. That's, I knew that when I was very young. So this, this idea that through simple faith, I could receive something that I had not earned, that, that, was, that was hard for me to believe. But of course, God's spirit was gracious to me and he made me alive so that I might believe and receive. Here we have a similar kind of thing going. They, they had to see it. They wanted to inspect it. And when they encountered it, they were amazed. One of the other disciples wasn't there, a disciple by the name of Thomas. I, I don't like to refer to Thomas as the doubting Thomas. I, I think that's probably a bit that's, that's to pigeonhole Thomas. There were many other strengths and weaknesses that he had. And who among us haven't, haven't experienced a little bit of Thomas at times in our own thinking and in our own faith walks? We all at times struggle with doubt, I'm sure. But Thomas had said famously in John chapter 20, verse 25, when he heard about this, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And we're like, oh, that's the doubting Thomas. This is the doubting Peter. This is the doubting rest of the apostles. They all doubted at first. Not just Thomas, they all doubted. Ultimately, Jesus revealed himself specially to Thomas and Thomas did believe and actually is the first apostle to definitively say, my Lord and my God. By the way, Jehovah's Witnesses consider that an exclamation because they deny the deity of Christ. They say, oh, he was just saying like, oh, gee, like, oh, my God. People would never have used that language back in the first century. This was a declaration of Jesus' deity, my Lord and my God. He's the, first, the doubter is the first to definitively declare the full deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is gracious with him, but this is God's ideal. Four verses later in John 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. I have not seen, although I have experienced Christ and I believe. Now I know the story behind the story that God works graciously in order to enable us to believe. I know that. Because in my natural man, I'm a doubter, I'm a skeptic. God grants us the ability to believe, but he also calls us to believe. 
And when we believe and put our faith in him, there is blessing. And that belief and that faith needs to be renewed day by day. We need to walk by faith, not by sight. We need to continue believing in God in order that we might be steadfast and that our hope might be sure. People often say, you know, religion is the world's problem. Actually, human reason without revelation is the world's problem. We always mess it up. But with revelation, we see who we are, who Jesus is, what his plan is for our lives, what his purposes are, and our lives are transformed by it. The gospel seems hard to believe, but that's because we're comparing it to human knowledge, human ability, human experience, human expectations, human constructs. But in and of itself, it is the power to transform. And so our job as God's people is to reasonably present it, but also just to present it. Because God will take the revelation that he has provided us in Scripture and he will use it for his own purposes to bring life change into us. And I, and I hope that all of you that have come today already know this. This is just a reminder. But if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, may I make a tremendous offer to you, an invitation to you. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible teaches us that all, myself included, are born sinners. We're rebels without a justifiable cause. And we are destined to a Christless eternity because we have rebelled against and rejected our ultimate creator. But God, being rich in love, sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for us so that we might be reconciled to God. And we don't receive the gift of eternal life then by our own religious merit. Jesus already accomplished it all and conquered our enemy. We receive eternal life by trusting in his work for us. And God does a divine work and transforms us by the power of the gospel. But let me conclude with this. Most of you here today are Christians. I know that. And you've already trusted in Christ. But perhaps the big question on the table for you today is, are you trusting him day by day? Are you living in light of the resurrection hope that you have? Is there a little bit of fear there? You need to confess to the Lord. Is there a little bit of idolatry as you trust the godless experts of the world and have not been spending time in the word of God, allowing yourself to be informed by his word and his ways? Are you representing him well? When was the last time you shared the Easter story with a friend or a colleague? Are you open and honest about your faith or are you hiding your Light, as we say, under a bushel, not, not allowing the world to know what your true identity is. If so, repent of those things. And even as you enter into this week, look for opportunities not only to live a transformed life because of the power of the resurrection, but also to declare it and proclaim it to other people so that they too might hear the full gospel story. 